Okay, so this video is for AP Bio, topic 7.6 and 7.7. .7. We're going to discuss evidence for evolution as well as common ancestry. So let's go ahead and look at some different scientific fields of study that provide evidence to support evolution. So we have geographical data, we have geological data, we have physical data, we have biochemical and molecular data, as well as mathematical data. So let's go ahead and start with the geographical. So in biogeography, we're really looking at the geographic distribution of organisms around the world. So if we look at like the land masses on Earth, the different continents, at one point, millions of years ago, the land masses were all connected in like Pangaea, right? So any species that were, that did evolve before Pangaea separated, before tectonic plates moved the continents apart, you'll find those organisms broadly distributed throughout Earth. Uh, however, once land masses began to separate, like my favorite example is uh, mammals and marsupials, which I talked about in my convergent evolution video. Um, but once Australia like breaks off of um, the rest of the continent, uh, it broke off before true placental mammals evolved. And so marsupials have a lot in common with mammals, but they um, are distantly related. Now, biogeography also... Um, I think would also imply a little bit of um, convergent evolution a tiny bit, how the different habitats on planet Earth can also drive selective forces uh, to have organisms look similar. We also have in biogeography this idea of islands and how evolution happens pretty rapidly on islands. Now, one reason why evolution would happen rapid on islands is because it has a small gene pool. So when you have favorable mutations that arise on an island in such a small gene pool, they can be favored and then spread pretty quickly throughout the population. So islands are hotspots for biodiversity as well as lots of evolution happening. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and talk about geological data. So one of my favorite examples of geologic data in the fossil record is the evolution of horses. When I took a vertebrate zoology class in college, our professor had a huge skeleton of a horse leg. And when you look at a horse leg, like down by its horseshoe, or not a horseshoe, yeah, that's what it's called. Um, it's hoof, I'm sorry, where the horseshoe goes, uh, you can actually see little bone slivers on the side. And so when we look at the fossil record, we see through 50 million years of horse evolution that the ancestor to modern horses was actually pretty small and lived in like a forest ecosystem. But as the North American continent m migrated, um, the amount of sunlight and rainfall striking the ecosystem converted it from like a forest to a grassland, which is a topic for ecology later. Um, but anyway, so then our, horse, our horses became more like grazers and herbivores, and uh, they, their feet evolved from walking on multiple toes to the outer, outer toes actually becoming kind of like vestigial structures, which we'll talk about later, and they began to become reduced in size. And so we can see through the fossil record the disappearing of those other fingers or toes, and now in modern horses, there's just bone slivers on the side that represent the former uh, toes and fingers of horses. Now, the other cool thing is that horse hoof were the like a horseshoe gets hammered in, that's just the toenail <laughs> of the horse. And actually what we think of as its foot is actually its long middle finger. And so anyway, horses are pretty rad. Uh, and then uh, how they walk. And then my other, one of my other favorite examples is the evolution of whales. Uh, whales are mammals. Their ancestor actually had fur and lived on land, but through 70 million years, um, they evolved in the water along with other marine mammals like dolphins and uh, whale, no, whales, uh, sea lions, seals, manatees, sea otters. And so the ancestor to modern whales actually had four legs and you can see through 70 million years of the fossil record, we can see the transition of legs into fins or flippers. Uh, in modern whales, they also have a vestigial structure of a pelvic bone. Like today, a current whale swimming in the ocean has a pelvic bone, even though there's no legs uh, developing from it. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about physical data. So something is <laughs> that we'll talk about is called homologous structures. Now a homologous structure, uh, we can think about the word homologous from like meiosis, uh, homologous means similar or same. So homologous structures 
uh, provide evidence for common ancestry because they start out from basically like the same genes or similar development, but they take different forms in the adult. For example, in mammals, we all have a humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals. And so our bone structures uh, are all from the same bones, but they have different adult forms and different functions. So the leg of a cat and the front flipper of a whale both have the same bone structure, homologous structures, but they have different purposes. Now you add it in a flying mammal of a bat who also has these same bones. And now here you have three different structures uh, that are all homologous, but provide different functions. So if you watched my video on convergent evolution already, the very end I talked about divergent evolution. So here we're seeing divergent evolution and the evolution of mammals uh, coming from a common ancestor with these bone structures. But then as time has gone on, these different um, bones have taken a different adult forms depending on the environments and the different selective pressures. Now, homologous structures are different than analogous structures, and analogous structures are not due to common ancestry. The wing of a bird and the wing of an insect uh, do not share homologous structures. Rather, they're an example of convergent evolution uh, where flight has been favored in both of these species, but it's not due to common ancestry. Okay. So let's go ahead and talk about biochemical or molecular data. So this is where we're looking at DNA uh, sequences or amino acid sequences, and we're gonna use similarities and differences to draw the evolutionary relationship of species. So when two organisms have very few differences between their DNA code, their DNA sequence, in a particular gene, that would imply very recent common ancestor. Versus if they had a lot of differences between their DNA sequences, that would imply they were distantly related and their common ancestor was further back in time. You will use this um, molecular data when you draw your phylogenetic threes in topic 7.9. All right, all right. So uh, we also have mathematical. So if you've already finished uh, population genetics and Hardy-Weinberg, we can mathematically calculate whether or not allele frequencies are changing in a population. And so that would also be microevolution. Okay. Now we're switching gears and going into the next set of standards from College Board here. So what we're going to look at now is we'll spend some time on the fossil record and understanding that a little bit. And then we'll talk about molecular homologies. So the fossil record uh, is pretty rad, right? So when life dies, especially if it's living near water, it has this opportunity to be buried and like to sink to the bottom and then be buried in sediment. Now it's estimated that 99% uh, of all life that has ever lived on Earth is extinct already, but they don't all leave fossils, right? Think about a worm. For a worm to leave a fossil without a skeleton would be very difficult. It'd have to have like perfect conditions, right? So uh, there's tons of life on Earth that maybe didn't have a shell or a skeleton or maybe didn't die in a way that it could be buried in sediment. And so there's tons of fossils that will never, that don't exist or we won't be able to ever find them. Right. So anyway, the cool thing about fossils in the fossil record is that because this sedimentary rock was formed as sediment and the bottom of water settled down to the bottom, we know that the bottom layers are the oldest and the layers closer to the top are the more recent. And so the oldest fossils are going to be found in the bottom and then the newer fossils can be found near the top. So if we study the fossil record and the rock layers, we can actually see like transitional species moving uh, throughout time. And so that's how we know, like with the horse evolution, we can look at the fossil record of 50 million years and we can look at uh, how horses have changed. Now, um, we can also, for organisms that didn't die that long ago, so for example, like the saber-toothed cat. Uh, saber tooth cat went extinct about 11 or 12,000 years ago. Um, around, we have like an ice age, about 11 like if you watch the movie Ice Age, right, there's a saber tooth cat in it. They went extinct at the end of the last Ice Age. And so uh, that organism only being about 12,000 years extinct, that fossil, we would be able to use um, carbon-14, uh, like, dating, basically. So uh, in our atmosphere, we have different um, carbon isotopes, C12, C13, and C14. Well, C14 is radioactive and has a half-life of 5,730 5, years. So every five... Oh my gosh, Mary, 5,730 years, you will have the amount of carbon-14 is cut in half. 
So there is like a limit to when we can use this, but if fossils aren't that old, we can actually use um, carbon-14 uh, dating to see the age of the fossil, depending on how much uh, carbon-14 is left um, in that fossil. So if there's zero carbon-14, we know it's older you know, than 20,000 years or so. And then there's geographical data. So we can look at the distribution of fossils throughout our planet and see um, where about like their evolution, right? And their age. So one of my favorite examples I heard about in college was that um, when you uh, scientists were first like understanding uh, fossils and plate tectonics hadn't really been discovered yet or understood yet, uh, they found fossils at, along the coast of Africa, as well as the coast of South America. And the fossils were for some like tropical plants and extinct dinosaurs. And they both were in the same like region of the rock layer. Uh, and scientists were like, what the heck? There's a whole Atlantic Ocean in between the two continents. So they actually hypothesized that there was some kind of land bridge where the organisms could cross back and forth. And maybe the land bridge had just been washed away because they did not have tech plate tectonics to explain that. Now we've also found tropical plant species uh, fossils in Antarctica. So that shows us um, what life was like a long time ago. Okay, now let's go ahead though and talk about mo morphological homologies. So morphological means like shape or structure. So we have the homologous structures that we already talked about. Uh, and you can also look at like here on the right, I have the uh, shells and things of like turtles. So that would be uh, morphological showing similarities are most likely related. Now we do wanna be careful though. Sometimes if you're only using fossils, um, Convergent evolution can make things confusing. If you were to look at the fossil of a placental mammal mole, a mole is an animal that digs underground, versus a marsupial mole that you found in Australia, their fossils are gonna look very similar, but it's not due to common ancestry. That's due to um, uh, similar selective pressures uh, in the same environment and convergent evolution. So sometimes using only morphological data can be a bit misleading. You wanna be careful of that. This is why molecular data is always gonna be a stronger piece of evidence uh, if we can actually look at the DNA or amino acid sequences. Now also in developing embryos, one thing I learned in my vertebrate zoology class in college that I thought was really fascinating was that all things that have a backbone, all vertebrates, have four traits in common. And we can see these traits while we develop. So one of them is a notochord and a dorsal hollow nerve cord. Now these will eventually form our spine and our, our um, spinal cord. And we also have pharyngeal gill slits while we're developing, which you can see in these pictures here, and a post-anal tail. And now as humans, like we don't have gill slits and we don't have tails as adults, but as embryos and during development, we do. But then changes in gene expression, we turn those genes off and then the tail, go, the cells that make up the tail actually go through apoptosis. But now today as an adult, like I have, or we all have a tailbone, which is a vestigial structure. Now I am a procrastinator. And when I was pregnant with my first son, I waited to like 13 weeks pregnant to finally go to the doctors and get a sonogram. And because I went at such an awkward time, I actually have a picture of my son's tail during development. Most women go at like eight or nine weeks and then closer to 20 weeks. Uh, for me, I went right at the sweet spot. Um, anyway, so now uh, let's go ahead though. I've mentioned vestigial structures a few times with the pelvic bone of the whale and the uh, like toe slits, I don't know what they're really called, um, little fragments of bone, I guess, on the horse legs. So vestigial means, or is a term used to describe something that is no longer of use in the present day organism, but it shows that an ancestor, uh, in an ancestor, it served a function. So for example, uh, we have, the, this is my favorite one actually, is that there's actually blind cave fish Right, so these blind cave fish actually will develop in their skeleton an eye socket, but no eye develops. And so this shows that the ancestor of these fish had eyes, but today they don't. Um, and our flightless birds, they have wings, they are birds, but they don't fly. So their ancestors flew. <laughs> uh, and then uh, snakes um, evolved their reptiles, right? So reptiles have four legs, generally amphibians, um, newts and stuff and lizards uh, they have four legs but snake ancestors um, also had legs but through natural selection 
uh, snakes actually lost their legs. They were selected against. Now, there are some species of snakes that have little tiny stubs for like arms, but they're non-functional. If you've seen the Disney movie, uh, The Good Dinosaur, that little snake friend that the kid makes, uh, or the dinosaur makes, um, uh, has little legs that are non-functional. So that's showing like the ancestor to modern snakes today, but there's actually a pelvic bone in snakes. Okay, and we're almost done, guys. Good job for sticking in. This is our last set of standards here that uh, says many fundamental molecular and cellular features are conserved across organisms. Oh, sorry about that cell membrane up there. Uh, so processes that are conserved across organisms is like all life on Earth, all cells do glycolysis. It happens in the cytoplasm of all cells. Then all cells, no matter if you're a prokaryote or a eukaryote, we all do DNA replication using helicase and DNA polymerase 3 and nucleotides, etc. And we all do protein synthesis. So that genetic code is universal. In every single organism on Earth, AUG will always code for methionine. UUU will always code for phenylalanine. So these are universal processes that are conserved across all domains. Um, on earth. Now, as far as structural and functional evidence, so there we have DNA is the hereditary material in all cells on earth. We also have, um, we all use a proton gradient to make ATP. So in us, we have our mitochondria that is going to establish that proton gradient, but bacteria will actually pump protons right outside their cell membrane, and then they'll fuse back through the ATP uh, synthase into their cytoplasm. And then our last thing we all have in common is the cell membrane. Sorry, up there in the top corner is my rough draft. I forgot to delete it, sorry, sorry. Um, so now, uh, the other thing though, the second part of this says, structural and functional evidence supports the relatedness of organisms in all domains. So when we look at the three major domains of life on Earth, we have bacteria and archaeans, which together make up prokaryotes. They are single cells and they reproduce by binary fission. Then we have eukarya, which is our eukaryotic cells. Now things uh, that we all have in common, oh, my video got cut off at the bottom, but DNA replication, protein synthesis, and glycolysis. Those are universal uh, among all organisms on earth, all three domains. Now, if we look at our last topic, um, topic 7.7, it's very short. The only difference really between this and the previous slide is that it's talking about uh, eukaryotes only, right? So when we talk about common ancestry of eukaryotes, here we see that eukaryotes share organelles, membrane-bound organelles, uh, linear chromosomes, as well as, uh, oh, got cut off, as well as genes that have introns. And so that rounds out 7.6 and 7.7. .7. Uh, great job.